Good afternoon. Um, we, we have some good news and not so good news, but the not so good news isn't truly bad news. I'll explain all this in a minute. Uh, <clears throat> Michael and Susan Gottesman became grandparents the other day uh, in Canada. So Michael will not be speaking today. He's busy learning how to change diapers and that sort of stuff. But uh, he will speak on another occasion about the NIH intramural uh, research plans uh, for the near and not so near uh, future. Um, but we have uh, an unexpected uh, second speaker who will be here shortly. And uh, uh, as you'll see, that's the president of the United States. So just be patient and stay in your seats. And you think I'm kidding. <laughs> OK. So um, uh -huh. okay. just hit the space bar if you need to advance it. Hit this, just hit the space bar. It'll be easier. Push one. Bar. Oh, I can push this one. Yeah. yeah. There we go. OK. So this is an encapsulation of uh, uh, today's uh, uh, discussion. Uh, <clears throat> the, the realization, for example, that uh, normal histologic examination of malignancies, for example, uh, you know, may reveal in two patients, something that looks almost the same by conventional and slightly modified stains. And yet, there's the important fact that maybe one patient is going to respond to a given drug or an antibody, uh, and the other patient isn't. And we're just beginning to unearth mechanisms uh, that may be responsible for that phenomena. And that's just one example of many that I'm sure you'll hear about from Eric, uh, uh, where our conventional diagnostic technology is undergoing a revolutionary change uh, due to the developments in technology and in biology itself. So. The changes in uh, uh, medicine that have taken place probably in the last 30, 40, 50 years, you know, have been substantial. But it doesn't take much imagination to believe that over the next decade, less, maybe more, there'll be a continued acceleration uh, into a almost complete revision of the way in which we approach uh, medical problems. Uh, we're limited, I think, only by our imagination. Well, this is more philosophy. But today, we're very fortunate uh, to have uh, Eric Green, who's the uh, director of the uh, National Human Genome Research Institute, uh, to talk to us about uh, this expanding uh, world of opportunity and challenge, particularly for young people. Uh, it's known as uh, personalized medicine is one term that's been used, precision medicine. I think there still is a lot of confusion as to what those terms mean. They certainly, amongst our lay friends who are intelligent people, they're always asking me, what's this all about? And uh, so part of Eric's job is an educational one as well, to be part of a large group presenting this, not only to legislators, but to public to understand that we really are in a period of unbelievable uh, excitement and opportunity. And I think limited to only to the extent of one's imagination 
and maybe a few million or trillion dollars that may be necessary to foster this. Well, uh, Eric received his MD and PhD degree from Washington University, uh, and he worked in the laboratory of Maynard Olson, who was one of the great figures in the early days of genomic research. Uh, he came to the uh, NIH as the director of the intramural research program uh, at what then was the National Center for Human Genome Research and ultimately became the National Human Genome Research Institute. Uh, in his own work, he's been at the forefront of uh, the use and development of genomic technology uh, for understanding various uh, eukaryotic processes, including uh, the characterization of many human disease genes. And this is all vastly expanded uh, since the time when he became director of the Genome Institute. Uh, aside from this, he has many other functions of an organizational nature of bringing together the diverse worlds of various omics and mass data. Uh, this is not a trivial challenge. It's not just a matter of having faster sequencers. It's a matter of how we're going to handle all of this information and, and uh, still educate people at the same time that it is not only valuable, one might say that it's essential. At any rate, Eric, it's a pleasure, and I'm glad that you are able to be with us. Thank you, Wynn. It, it's a pleasure to be here. I should actually uh, start by saying uh, thanks for braving the cold weather uh, to come over here from wherever you walked. Um, what I thought I would do, and again, originally, I only found out this weekend that I'm going solo because of uh, Michael's uh, uh, quick departure from town, understandably, to go see his new grandson. Um, so I, I modified this a little um, over the weekend, even a little into today. And what I'm going to really do is, as much as anything, just paint a landscape of what has gone on and going on in human genomics, why there's all this excitement about precision medicine, and how many of us working in this area, which includes, I know, many of you, really see this as a great opportunity for improving human health. And the first slide Wynn showed actually, I think, is incredibly appropriate, showing sort of this bridge being built um, from some very basic activities to actually for changing how we practice medicine. And, and when it all began, and I'll start where it began in a minute, in genomics, uh, we really were on one side of that body of water. And uh, what has intervened and what we now see on the near horizon truly is a connection um, that will yield a functional bridge in many ways, and that, of course, will lead to improving human health, which is obviously very exciting. I also know many of you, so I realize I am dealing with a very heterogeneous audience here. Some of you know more about some of the subtopics I'm going to talk about than I do. Um, and, uh, but, I'm just, so I'm, but my goal here really is just to paint the landscape in a review-oriented mode, and I'm obviously happy to take any questions um, along the way or at the end. So I've been involved in this field of genomics, um, actually, uh, since the inception of the word genomics. In fact, 1987 was a very significant year for me personally. It was when I graduated medical school and graduate school. But it was also the first time the word genomics was actually put into the scientific press, reflecting how young this discipline is, despite the fact that it is now in common usage. Uh, indeed, the first use of the word genomics in the scientific literature was in a lead editorial of a brand new journal named Genomics. Um, and in the, lead audit, in the lead editorial written by the editors, uh, they described this newly developing discipline of mapping and sequencing of the genome and the analysis of the information and adopting the term genomics. And I just want to emphasize, therefore, what a young field this really is, unlike other disciplines, chemistry, biology, and so forth, which in some cases go, you know, decades and decades. This is a remarkably young discipline. But what I'm going to tell you about is how much has happened in genomics that is setting up the current circumstance that we find ourselves in. It also reflects, by the way, especially for the young folks in the audience, I never heard the word genomics once in all of medical school or all of graduate school because the word hadn't been invented yet. And here I am, the head of the institute, the largest funder of genomics research in the world, 
having no formal education really in genomics. It shows you that uh, you're a lifelong learner because new opportunities come up and you find yourself in a circumstance of wanting to be part of that even though it wasn't part of your formal education. Now the reason the late 1980s was important and genomics was coined as a term and the concept of mapping and sequencing the human genome was coming to the fore was because it was then that there was this intense planning for this audacious endeavor called the Human Genome Project, um, which kicked off in 1990. In fact, the institute I now lead um, was created by the U.S. Congress to lead the U.S.'s effort in the Human Genome Project. It was an unprecedented project, both in its size and its, and its uh, uh, audacious goals and its international flavor and its team orientation of achieving the goals of the Genome Project. It was also uh, notable in that it was remarkably successful. Um, this past October marked the 25th anniversary of, uh, the, of the start of the Human Genome Project, which for some of us, and I was there as a postdoctoral fellow involved on the first day of the project, it's hard to imagine it was 25 years, but indeed it has been. But the great aspect of this uh, is the remarkable success of the project, finishing a couple years ahead of schedule, but most importantly, accomplishing all of its goal, goals, including the reading out for the first time the complete sequence of the three billion letters that constitute the human genome sequence. Um, to commemorate this, and by the way, I guess I emailed to somebody and it's put up on some website papers, right? So one of the several papers that I made available was a perspective piece that I wrote uh, with Jim Watson and Francis Collins. The three of us are the three people that have been directors of, of NHGRI over the, since the beginning of the Institute. And we wrote a perspective piece about 25 years of big biology and how the Human Genome Project taught us some very important lessons about how big science can be done very successfully you know, for biomedical research projects. I would encourage you to look at that if you're interested in it. Uh, the other thing I guess I should say I was reminded is that to sort of um, uh, review some of the legacy aspects of the Human Genome Project, our institute is sponsoring, uh, I think it's a six-part series, monthly seminar series, which kicked off last month, um, where we're bringing people back who were involved in the Genome Project's design, such as Maynard Olson, or execution, such as some of our other speakers. And we are being held in Lipset pretty much the last Thursday of every month at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. So Maynard Olson, who you heard in the introduction, who I trained with as a postdoctoral fellow, is giving a talk in Lipset next Thursday at 2 o'clock talking about the early days of the Genome Project. If you're interested in that kind of historic stuff, I welcome you to please come to those talks um, uh, because I think they will be of interest for people who want to hear about those sorts of details of the Genome Project. So that has sort of really set the stage for what truly has been a quarter century of remarkable advances in genomics. So let me paint that landscape to start with. What have been the major crowning achievements of genomics over the last 25 years? Well, one of them was what I just told you, that we actually sequenced the human genome for the first time as part of the Human Genome Project. That certainly is triumph number one um, of the last quarter century of highlights in genomics. But of course, you know, that really was just the beginning of what is a much longer term vision that certainly my institute has and I think many people now have. And that is the recognition that we didn't just want to understand our blueprint and have the sequence available to us for the fundamental knowledge. That, of course, is incredibly important. But ultimately, we want to use that information to change the way we practice medicine. And this leads into what Wynne was saying in the introduction and the notion of personalized medicine, individualized medicine, genomic medicine, precision medicine, I'll come back to precision medicine at the end. The term we really focus on at our institute, NHGRI, is genomic medicine because we keep a sort of a laser focus on genomic information. And we regard genomic medicine as an emerging medical discipline that involves using genomic information about an individual as part of their clinical care and, of course, the implications of that. And our focus is to broaden what we are thinking about in the field of genomics and what we think about our institute to sort of build that bridge from the starting line of the Human Genome Project to basically eventually realizing genomic medicine. And one might imagine it was certainly programmatically important for the field to do and for our institute to do since we were originally created by the U.S. Congress as an institute to lead the Genome Project in the U.S. But of course, once that ended, we had no interest in shutting down the institute. We said we need to expand our goals, and our goals include realizing genomic medicine. Now, the fact of the matter is this is going to be a long journey involving many steps. I don't pretend for a minute to even know what all the steps are, but we can anticipate many of them, and we have to be prepared for surprises along the way. I also know it's not going to involve one, one institute. It's not going to involve one community. It's not even going to involve one country. 
to make this a reality. This is a long, long journey, um, and we need to be prepared for traversing that journey in a fashion sort of similar to what we thought about as we organized the Genome Project. Um, not by individuals working alone, but rather a very large consortium of scientists from multiple disciplines involving multiple institutes, funding agencies, countries, and so forth, thinking about all the things that have to be worked through to eventually uh, reach the goal. So a marathon analogy, I think, is a very valid one. Well, what has transpired? What are the other major highlights in this marathon as we try to think about eventually changing the practice of medicine by using things like genomic information? Well, I would say the highlight that immediately should be emphasized um, beyond just getting that first sequence was to come up with better methods for actually sequencing DNA, sequencing genomes. And in fact, we needed to reduce the cost substantially for, for what it costs to sequence a human genome. And in fact, we've accomplished that by doing this in a fashion that has reduced the cost of sequencing a human genome nearly a million fold. Now, this did not happen by accident by any means. Uh, however, the day the Human Genome Project ended, um, our institute declared as a goal for the community of genomicists that we needed better ways to sequence DNA um, that would eventually allow a human genome to be sequenced for $1,000. And we picked a very rounded number of $1,000, and, and we put that into, uh, actually put it into press with our names on it. And it was an audacious thing to do the day the Genome Project ended, because the day the Human Genome Project ended, um, we had just sequenced the first human genome. And it came at a cost of about a billion dollars, roughly, if you round up. Yeah, and so here we were saying, well, just knock six zeros off of that figure, and uh, eventually you'll deliver a $1,000 genome. And this became sort of a battle cry for the community, but it also became an organizing framework for our institute in particular um, to develop a research agenda to get scientists engaged in coming up with crazy ways of sequencing DNA and crazy ideas for new models for how you might read out uh, DNA and genomes. Fortunately, the private sector got very interested in this as well. Um, and in the intervening years since the Genome Project was really only a little over a decade, it has been incredible what has happened through both our, what our, we saw the scientific community do in the academic world, but also what companies got built up around the industry got built up and commercialized instruments, making this a, a remarkably successful endeavor. Uh, Nature Magazine has written about this, the $1,000 genome. Uh, we keep track of this, and in green shows the precipitous decline in the cost of sequencing in particular over the last 10 years. And there's all new technologies, and it's truly remarkable. And this has led to just not only an incredible advance in the cost of sequencing, but also the pace at which we can get human, a human genome sequence, which puts us in the realm of becoming a diagnostic test. And so to put this into context, again, that first human genome sequence, the very first one by the Genome Project, it cost a billion dollars, but it also took six to eight years to generate, also involved thousands of people in multiple countries and all the things that are impractical. But today, today, on this campus alone, and not to mention many other places around the world, uh, there are machines and devices that use fancy looking chip devices such as that, that now can prodigiously put out large amounts of DNA sequence. In the case of sequencing human genomes, can generate a human genome sequence, not quite in a day, although we're going to get there, but a few days, and at costs that are not quite $1,000, but again, the trend says we're going to get there. Now it's really just a few thousand or a couple thousand dollars, depending exactly how you do your cost accounting. We are in striking distance of having a $1,000 genome in something like a day, and to be honest with you, that's sort of, I think we'll coast to there. That's sort of not even something that I worry about, particularly a lot at night, because I'm convinced we're going to get there in short order. So the other uh, thing that's pretty remarkable is that the technology advances for DNA sequencing are not ending. Um, we know about all sorts of additional new technologies that will supplant the really cool ones we have in our labs on this campus right now. Uh, one of the ones that's being tested just as an example is shown here by a company. Uh, it uses a fancy new technology called nanopores, which I'm not going to tell you details about. But just to show you the innovations that are coming out, this is a device that allegedly will work as follows. Plugs into the USB port of your laptop, you squirt on it some blood, and they claim within about a day or so you'll have a human genome sequence. Uh, now, things need to be refined, and there's some problems, but there always are problems when technologies are immature. As this gets hard, and this might be, and if this one doesn't work, there'll be other ones we know that are coming down the pipeline in two or three years. This is not science fiction. And it's just remarkable to think about it. The other thing that's really reassuring about this device, according to the company, 
is that it will work equally well in a PC or a Macintosh laptop, which <laughs> nothing else seems to work equally well. So if they pull that one off, I'll be impressed. So armed with better methods for sequencing DNA, uh, needless to say, it gave us the opportunity to now say, well, it's inexpensive. Now we can sequence a lot of human genomes. Um, and by sequencing lots and lots of human genomes, we're going to start to learn about how all of us are different. And in fact, we have now sequenced tens of thousands and it'll soon be hundreds of thousands of human genomes um, around the world. And this has given us the opportunity to study variation, differences in our genomes, the spellings across the three billion letters that represent our genomes. Now, any two of us differ by about one out of a thousand letters in our genome ballpark. And so if you think about it, if you, your genome, you have, actually you have two genomes, right? You got three billion letters from mom, three billion letters from dad, six billion total. If you do the arithmetic differing, differing one out of a thousand, that gives you millions and millions of differences between the, you and the person sitting next to you. So you can represent these simply as just as variants, but it also turns out that most of those variants that any one of us have are actually fairly common. They're represented in a few percent of the population. Um, so it's not like you have a private set of variants that are only yours. In fact, very few of your variants are only yours or your immediate family. In fact, most of your variants are boring variants that exist in, in multiple people, maybe even in this room. That makes it a relatively finite problem because it means that wouldn't it be nice if we could get deep, deep, deep catalogs of variants that exist in the human population at relatively high frequency and then have scientists study those variants and figure out whether those variants mean anything. By the way, most of your variants actually have no consequence on your health or well-being or anything else. They're actually almost for certain have no functional consequence. But a small subset of your variants might not, might not be very good. They may give a greater risk for getting a disease. And then there might be other variants that might be good variants. They may protect you from getting disease or have some other positive attribute associated with it. Well, the goal was let's get knowledge of variation across the human population. And the sequencing got to be cheap. We could do this readily because, you know, when the Genome Project ended, we only knew about maybe tens of thousands of variants that existed among different people's genomes. And we knew there were tens and tens of millions of ones out there. And so various projects have been done since the end of the Genome Project, but the most recent one, which just ended, is a project called the Thousand Genomes Project, another international effort involving many scientists around the world. In this case, it involved collecting individual people's DNA from around the world because we want to get geographical diversity. And in fact, in total, we sampled about 26 populations. And as often is the case in genomics, we're overachievers. We went past 1,000 genomes and went up to over 2,500 genomes. And these individuals' genomes were sequenced, and the variants were um, first in a, originally described a few years ago how this was being done, but just this fall um, was a conclusion of the project, putting all of this into publicly available databases so that scientists can now see what now amasses to nearly 90 million known variants that exist at different sites in our genome, and now having information to basically start to study which of those variants are biologically and medically relevant and which ones are not. So that has greatly enhanced our understanding about where in our genomes we differ from one another. The next, of course, big key thing was, well, what do those variants mean? I mean, when does it mean something? When does it change the function of what our genome's actually doing? Our genome's encoding all this biological information. We need to know when there's functional sequences doing something, and then we need to know when a variant is in it, how it might influence it, because that's going to have a lot to do with our health and well-being. And indeed, over, over the intervening now nearly 13 years since the end of the Genome Project, we have profoundly advanced our understanding about how the human genome actually functions. But keep in mind, this is still just the first 13 years of accumulated knowledge about what these three billion letters actually do. Now, let's be clear, that is, we always knew that was going to take decades and decades to accomplish. The Genome Project was really just about producing this. It was just about producing the order of the Gs, As, Ts, and Cs, three billion of them and represented here as 0.0001% of what the Human Genome Project uh, achieved. But we always recognized that, like great literature, we were going to require scientists to take decades and probably multiple generations to peer over those three billion letters and figure out where are the important sequences, what do they do, and how do they biologically carry out all the complicated choreography necessary for human development and human life. Well, what have we learned in the last 13 years, at least our first quick read of the genome as we've developed better and better ways of understanding the language of the human genome sequence? 
Well, I'll give you some of the high level lessons. We have learned, for example, that about one and a half percent of our letters directly code for proteins. Proteins are the brick and mortar of cells. They're the stuff that make, that make biology happen. But it only is one and a half percent of the letters in our genome code for proteins, our protein coding genes. Uh, we know there's about 20,000 genes in our genome, um, but that's a minority of the functional sequences in our genome. We know that there's at least another three, maybe about four or upwards of 10% all still being argued about, but a much higher percent of sequences that don't, that are functionally important. Actually, they're conserved across almost all mammals, so they go way back in evolution. And they're doing things other than coding for proteins. We're, we're, the, this is stuff we really don't understand very well, although we're gaining some insights. What we do know is that a lot of those purple sequences are regulating where, when, and how much genes are turned on in different tissues at different different points in life. So there's a, our complexity is not in our gene number. Our complexity is in the circuitry that controls and regulates our genes. That's why we are more complicated than simpler organisms. It is the choreography of what we do with our genes through these other signals that are coming in in these non-coding portions of our genome. Lots to be learned, but we're making progress. And the other, I think, major high-level advance in the last 13 years is a recognition that beyond the order of the G's, A's, T's, and C's is a whole other language. It's a language you'll hear called epigenomics, which is basically where DNA gets decorated or gets modified or gets associated with other molecules. And it's this interaction of DNA and these other molecules that influences how DNA behaves. And so in green is reflecting regions that we're now learning where things are happening to the DNA. They're getting marked by epigenomic processes that's influencing um, function of the genome. And that, in fact, that's one of the ways probably the environment influences our DNA by, in, by basically creating epigenomic marks on our DNA. And again, we're in early days of fully fleshing this out, but it's clearly very important for genome function and actually almost for certain important for health and well-being. A lot of efforts are going on around the world to understand comprehensively um, the functional sequences in the human genome. Um, one of the ones that we're proud of at our institute is a project called ENCODE, which started almost immediately after the Genome Project ended and continues now and will continue in the coming years. It stands for Encyclopedia of DNA Elements. It's an international effort that we fund to basically catalog all the functional sequences in the human genome and make that data publicly available on browsers. And so, for example, it, it really is like developing a GPS for the human genome. And just like, you know, a value of a GPS isn't just the roadmap, you know, you want to know not only the roadmap, you want to know where all the important things are on that road, where is the next, you know, where you're find, trying to find something, a national park, you're trying to find a gas station, a good restaurant. So that's sort of what a GPS enhanced view is, and that's what we're trying to accomplish here. So this is a complicated view of one segment of the human genome, which is incomprehensible, but it illustrates the complexity of the kind of data that we're generating. And you can zoom in on a browser, any region of the human genome now, and be overwhelmed with information about functional clues of that DNA, whether it be where are the genes, uh, where are the conserved sequences, you know, where are regions of the genome that um, seem to be interacting with proteins that turn genes on and off, uh, what are the parts of DNA that get made into RNA, and remember we know that RNA now goes off and is important for making proteins, but is also important in doing other things, and so on and so forth. The bottom line is, Increasingly, we're getting richer and richer views of, and clues about functional landscape of the human genome by efforts like ENCODE and other efforts. And we've gone from knowing about this much about how the human genome works 13 years ago to maybe now knowing about this much. Of course, we eventually want to know this much, but you know, this, this is going to take decades. I always say it's a multi-generational issue. We'll be still looking at the human genome sequence decades from now and still trying to interpret all the intricacies without any doubt. But it, I think we've made great progress even in the last 13 years. Well, when you start to imagine that we can sequence human genomes much cheaper than before, we are getting better catalogs about how we differ, and we're beginning to understand what's functional, what's not, and if you figure out where there's a, a genomic variant and if it's in a functional sequence, how it might be changing the function of the genome, it starts to give you an understanding of putting it all together and now starting to think about how all this might influence um, things like our health and our well-being, a particular human disease. And I would contend that because of the first four advances on this slide, 
uh, advance number five has been also remarkable. We have made significant advances in unraveling the genomic basis of disease. And here, uh, there's, there's actually two stories to be told um, because it really relates to the two major classes of diseases. Virtually all, in fact, all diseases have at least some kind of a genetic and genomic influence, but the architecture of that influence is different, whether you're dealing with a very rare disease or you're really dealing with a very common, a relatively common disease. And there's been major advances in both and just sort of at a very high level. Let me just remind you. You know, there's rare diseases that many of you are familiar with, cystic fibrosis, Huntington's disease, um, sickle cell anemia, and so forth, that it's, they're rare in the population, but they're actually pretty simple. They're simple in that it is a single gene that harbors a mutation, and that breaks the gene, and that leads to the disease. And the, dominant, the major, major, major risk for getting the disease is a mutation in, in a single gene. And yeah, there might be other variants that might have some influence in the severity, and yeah, there might be some environmental influence. But by and large, the diseases I named, and thousands like them, um, it's pretty much a single gene that is broken. These are also known as monogenic, one gene, or Mendelian, after the famous geneticist Mendel. Um, here, it's been remarkable what has happened um, in the intervening years. Uh, let me just give you a number. The day the Human Genome Project began, 25 years, three months, whatever the arithmetic is, there were 61 rare diseases that we knew what the broken gene was, the defective gene was, 61. Um, and, and a lot has happened since then, and a lot continues to happen. There are thousands, but it, and I'm gonna give you the number in a second, but I would also tell you that there are, there are thousands still that we have to discover, and we could put this all together and make this go quicker. And so we actually have started a program, we just renewed it actually last week, announced the renewal of a program called the Centers for Mendelian uh, Genomics. And their goal through a series of centers is to accelerate the pace of figuring out what the defective gene is in the remaining now about three, here's, here's I'll just give you the punchline. 61, the day the Genome Project started, we knew the disease genes uh, for rare diseases. Now that figure is up to about 4,300. It's pretty remarkable, 61 to 4,300. But there are described about 7,400 total um, rare diseases that we believe a single gene is involved. So while the glass is more than uh, half full in terms of our knowledge, uh, we still have more to go, and that's why we have this program, to try to accelerate the pace uh, because we can put it all together now, especially with these revolutionary methods for sequencing DNA. So I would contend that's remarkable what has happened in the case of rare diseases, and uh, I believe we will fill in the remaining or much of this really over the next handful of years. And we're trying to make that happen quicker. Now, in the case of common, the other class of disease, common diseases, this is a much different story because of the underlying architecture. Now, common diseases are really what we need to think about more in terms of total healthcare burden. I mean, rare diseases are, are terrible and they, have, they take a great toll on families and certainly an aggregate on society. But it's not what fills hospitals and clinics around the world. What fills hospitals and clinics around the world are patients with common diseases like diabetes and cardiovascular disease and autism and Alzheimer's and et cetera. And, and these, in aggregate, are what we really have to think about um, from a medical point of view. And yet, they're complicated. And the reason they're complicated is because it's not a single gene that's involved in most cases. In fact, it's usually a series of variants in the genome some in genes, some elsewhere in the, in the genome, inevitably, and what is often, uh, we believe, a greater influence of the environment. So it's a more complicated problem. Um, and that's why they're called complex diseases or multigenic or, or non-Mendelian. There could be entire, there probably are entire lectures that have come in this series that talk about what's gone on in 13 years. But suffice it to say that imagine now we have knowledge of tens of millions of variants that are out there in the population. We have better and better technologies to figure out which of us carry which of those variants. And there are some very fancy studies that have been done and can be done um, to basically do very large studies of individuals, thousands and thousands of individuals with diseases like Alzheimer's and autism and diabetes, cardiovascular disease and so forth, and just simply amass enough data to get a statistical power to tease out which of the variants seem to be associated with getting the disease. And that gives clues where in the genome where one might look in greater um, with, with, with greater scrutiny to be able to find the causative variant. And all this has gone on, and I don't have time to talk about it, but let me just tell you that this general strategy, which some of you might have heard of, called genome-wide association studies, or GWAS, the first such study, the very first study was published in 2008. If you fast forward to 2015, 2016, 
Um, there's over 2,000 such publications that have taken, that describe successful studies using that exact strategy. And now implicating something like 4,000 regions of the human genome have very specifically been implicated uh, with a particular common disease. And while that hasn't given us the final answer, it has given us great clues of where to search in greater detail. And there are many efforts funded practically by every institute at NIH now to really go in a very aggressively to try to figure out in these regions uh, where there might be specific variants and how they might be influencing very important diseases like diabetes and autism and Alzheimer's and so on and so forth. So while I don't think we have as much to report on this, I think it's one of the exciting frontiers to look for, uh, you know, over the next 10 years. Well, this has all been fun because I've described all these first five great advances in, um, in genomics from the last quarter century, but I haven't said anything about medicine yet. Because even if, you, if I get you the diseases, we still haven't changed the practice of medicine. And the obvious question you might ask is, well, yeah, okay, that's all great, but you promised me genomic medicine. You promised me we were going to be using genomic information to change how we practice medicine. I would contend, and I probably couldn't say this as, um, as confidently even two or three years ago, is I believe there really are some vivid examples of genomic medicine in action now emerging. And they're giving us some very early clues about how things are going to sort of play out, I think, in the coming years. So let me shift gears now and just tell you what I think are sort of the hottest areas, with the first few being the ones that are here and now and the other ones just being hot because there's a lot of attention being given to them. So if you sort of said, Eric, what are sort of the five hottest areas of genomics really being used in a medical sense, this would be what my highlight reel would be. First one, which I've said almost nothing about, is cancer. Um, without question, um, cancer will be the clinical domain that will have the earliest um, use of genomics in a very real and practical way. Um, again, I'm sure you could have major talks entirely about this or multiple talks. At a very simple level, cancer is a disease of the genome. The reason you have tumors forming is because normal cells pick up mutations in their DNA, making those cells grow out of control. Well, when you have a tumor, you can open up its genome and read it out by the same methods you use to read out any kind of DNA. And that has been done many, many times now over major projects around the world, including here at NIH by a major project called the Cancer Genome Atlas that the Cancer Institute and our institute led for many years that has given us great insights about the common changes that take place in different types of cancer. But this is now also being translated um, in a very meaningful way um, to actually change the way cancer can be diagnosed and understood and then eventually treated. Um, you know, to be very simplistic, and I actually, uh, so I did train as a pathologist, although I trained as a laboratory, as a clinical pathologist, but, you know, we think about how cancer is typically diagnosed by, by, by pathologists looking under a microscope, and they will continue to do that to get histopathology insights about tumors, but already for some cancers, and increasingly this number will grow, part of a workup of any tumor is going to be using some fancy sequencing instrument to read out the genome sequence of that tumor and simplified cartoons are going to reflect a signature, if you will, of the derangements in that tumor that give that pathologist and therefore then the oncologist very specific information about uh, that particular type of cancer and that particular patient. And that's going to really influence their ability to be more accurate in prognosis and uh, hopefully eventually treatment as well. Um, that's my optimism. Uh, the fact is this is real. And uh, some of you may see it on TV uh, ads uh, that I certainly see here. And if you go to the website, you go to, you know, very well-known cancer centers such as this one, um, and, you know, they're just prominently featuring genomics this, genomics that, genomics everything. That is the buzzword in cancer now, and there's a lot that's going to be happening in this space. And earliest illustrations are very exciting, long way to go for all types of cancer, but believe me, I truly believe, I'm convinced this is going to be some of the earliest high impact of genomics in the clinic. I think the second hot area that is often talked about is already real, um, is in the arena of pharmacogenomics, big word, but it's just pharmacology and genomics brought together. Um, it's a pretty simple concept, but we've gotten some traction on it. The, I mean, the simple concept is that, you know, all of us respond differently, right? We're not all the same. Um, I'm the guy in the red shirt, for example, but, you know, I know lots of, some of you are probably the little kid in the white shirt, right? And, uh, and this, you know, it's true whether it's roller coasters, it also turns out it's the same for medications. You know, the fact of the matter is you know, all the medications that are sold at CVS or at Walgreens, they all work. You know, they just don't work for everybody, and we know that. Um, 
And the fact is we have learned a tremendous amount um, in recent years about differences in drug response among people. Uh, this is lifted from um, a, an article, a review that was in Nature last year, um, talking about imprecise medicine. Um, and shown here, 10 commonly used medications. And for every individual where that medication works in blue, there are all those other people in red where the medication doesn't work. So uh, this is daunting, but we've always known this. Uh, I, this. I learned this in medical school. That's why you, know, you try one medicine, doesn't work, you give them another medicine. That's just sort of... But what's happened with knowledge about genomic variation and studies such as we, I've described even for the way we would uh, tackle common diseases is we're beginning to learn which genomic variants are influencing pathways that metabolize drugs or deal with drug responses. And we're beginning to learn how to figure out whether an individual is going to be a good responder or a bad responder. And therefore, one can imagine, and again, this is not science fiction, taking all individuals with the same diagnosis and before you decide whether or not to give a medication or you decide the dosage of a medication, you first do genomic testing and stratify that group into those that are going to be good responders or no responders or bad responders. And it's just a much more rational way of doing business. Um, this, again, is already the case for a number of medications. Uh, the FDA now requires for over 100 medications labeling on the medication saying that you might want to consider getting genetic or genomic information from your patient before prescribing this medication. Um, and that list will likely grow. And while there's a lot more to be done and will be done, um, there already are some highly illustrative cases where this is now becoming standard, standard of care. The, the third uh, sort of hot area, which I think in many ways exemplified by things going on in this campus, because this campus has been a ripe area for very rare diseases, is the use of genomics for diagnostics for particularly very rare disorders and particularly rare disorders where the individual is basically is undiagnosed for their condition. Uh, Nature talked about this in an article a couple years ago when diseases seem to strike from nowhere. And they talked about when you can't figure out what's wrong with somebody, um, you know, nowadays you should just sequence their genome. Um, and indeed, uh, this has proven to be uh, a remarkably important and inexpensive way to get an answer. I mean, there are individuals um, that have, are involved in diagnostic odysseys involving many, many hospital visits, often multiple different doctors, in many cases multiple cities, building up bills of tens of thousands of dollars who can now be maybe analyzed by having their genome sequenced for a few thousand dollars and in about a quarter to a third of the time figure out what's wrong with that individual with that undiagnosed condition. This serves as a basis for a program started here by Bill Gall, shown there, um, a trans and IH program called the Undiagnosed Diseases Program um, that has done exactly that using the clinical center as a place to refer these um, cases into. Um, this highly successful program within the intramural component of NIH um, led us to ex then expand this program through the NIH Common Fund to create a national network of undiagnosed diseases uh, centers, shown here at the various um, other sites that are now up and operational. And has really, I think, it is demonstrating in a very routine way how um, genomic sequencing and critical phenotypic workup of these cases all coming together uh, can be highly effective for uh, these uh, cases, which in some cases have created great uh, suffering uh, to patients who have gone along uh, not carrying a diagnosis. Another um, area which really is, one component of it is here and now, and the other component is to be determined, is in the arena of what I call sort of the genomics of pregnancy. Now, here there's actually two stories, but they both fall into the, the general header of pregnancy. Um, one of these relates to what is going on in prenatal testing early in pregnancy. And here, it's been game-changing. It's actually, we're right in the middle of what truly is a bit of a revolution. The methods that have been developed for inexpensively sequencing DNA are so exquisitely sensitive that they allow the accurate detection and characterization of small, teeny bits of DNA. And one example of that is small, teeny bits of, of fetal DNA that floats around in maternal bloodstream. And so what that means is that rather, when, rather than doing an invasive test to get fetal DNA for routine uh, prenatal diagnostics, such as I did for both of my two children, uh, actually my wife did, I didn't have the needle stuck in me for amniocentesia, she did. Um, that was one option, or chorionic villa sampling is the other option, both of which risk the pregnancy, but both of which 
hundreds of thousands of, of, of women who go through every year up until recently. But now you could do it with a simple blood draw and get the same information. Um, this is not science fiction. This is well described now in the literature. Um, there are major awards that have been given to this field of study in the past few years. And you know, the popular press has picked this up, recognizing that, that the era of routine amniocentesis, chorionic villus sampling, is going to end. Um, and as a screening method, these non-invasive prenatal testing methods, which are remarkably simple from the point of view of that pregnant women are always getting lots of blood taken from. It's just one extra tube of blood. And there are many companies that have been set up to do this now and it has just taken off like a rocket. So shown here from a review last year, you can see that worldwide, if you add all these up, you know, well over a million and a half women worldwide have had non-invasive prenatal genome sequencing or genomic testing done. Um, and that trend is expected to even go higher um, as these methods get uh, more widely uh, just deployed and more companies get set up to do this. So this is here and now, and as already, in fact, some of you may know of friends um, or family members who are, have been pregnant recently are getting this test because it's becoming into standard use. Now, the other end of pregnancy, you have a newborn. And here, there's also another story that will evolve in the coming years. Uh, Time Magazine sort of, sort of hinted at this when they said a couple years ago in an article that maybe by 2025, everyone will get their DNA mapped at birth. I think they meant sequenced at birth. And that is an issue that has come up and has been discussed really for many years now. Should we just sequence everybody's genome at birth and put that in their electronic medical record and have it carry it through the rest of their life? And um, it's a good question. Um, and uh, it's not clear what the answer is. Um, what I will tell you um, is that we're not sure. I can tell you at our institute. And so we partnered with the Child Health Institute here. And we actually are studying this exact issue. Um, we're studying it both for the logistics of how would it actually be done and what would we learn and also for some of the ethical issues that one can immediately imagine about having a complete genome sequence on a newborn and who has access to the information, et cetera, et cetera. And so these are the initial sites that are, are, are part of this network of researchers that we have studying this. And our goal is to try to study it so that if we really ever get to a point where this is being proposed at a national level or even, even at a not national level, we will have a more informed um, set of data to help guide uh, decisions about the desirability of this. Because I think there's a lot of questions that need to be critically thought through. There is one setting where this is now proven to be extremely effective. It was um, really put on the map by, by a scientist who was at Children's Mercy and actually now recently moved to San Diego, still a grantee in this program. Um, he uh, basically got uh, quite interested in basically using the playbook of undiagnosed conditions, but doing it in a setting of a neonatal intensive care unit. Um, and Time uh, or Nature wrote a nice article describing this body of work where he basically was following a series of children in the neonatal intensive care unit that were basically going to die in a matter of days. The physicians, the neonatologists had no idea what was the matter with these children. Uh, studied over a series of, you know, in, in bringing, looking at children that came into NICUs over a period of several years and found that if the second you encountered that situation, you immediately sequenced the patient's genome. And he worked out a protocol that allowed him to get data back within a day. Um, that in about a quarter of the time, uh, they could get a diagnosis of what was wrong with that acutely ill neonate. And in some cases, we're able to figure out how to intervene to save their lives. Compelling cases. This is here and now. I hear more and more uh, NICUs that are now uh, approaching this sort of diagnostic uh, test as part of the routine case where they simply do not know what is wrong with this acutely ill newborn. So again, here and now, although it's a whole other story for healthy newborns, as I just mentioned. Now, my la fifth and last hot area is hot not because there's um, a solution or that it's implemented. It's hot because it's really important and it's really consuming a lot of people's attention. Um, and it, it simply relates to the idea that getting a genome sequence from about, for any of us, of, from us as individuals or for any of us who take care of patients, take, getting our patients' genomes, it's just trivial. I mean, there's really nothing complicated anymore about getting a genome sequence. But the truth of the matter is if you have a patient and you get their genome sequence, that's the easy part. When you actually go round on that patient in the morning, this is absolutely what you feel like. Because you can get out the three to five million variants in their genome that, that make them unique compared to some reference sequence, but you have no idea what most of those variants mean. There is a mismatch between our technological capability to get the data and our ability to actually understand what the data means. And, and this is, happening in a setting where the practice of medicine is 
complicated. It uh, involves quick interactions with patients. The whole healthcare delivery system is under great stress. And you know, we can't have this going on where we're asking busy healthcare professionals to go read you know, nature and science to figure out for every one of the variants what it means. And so we regard an important priority for the community, and we're embracing this at the Institute through a granting program, that to build a clinical genomics information system, and actually I shouldn't even just say it's us, it's internationally a huge challenge and we're actually interacting with multiple countries now to try to help solve this. We need the ability to very routinely feed patients' genome sequences into some resource that instantly tells busy pharmacists, busy clinicians, busy nurses, busy physician assistants, exactly what those variants mean. All this will go on transactionally through electronic health records, and that's good for genomics because our data is digital. Um, but also, we need to have this so quick that you know, someone's going to get an answer on their iPhone or their iPad or some the little device they're going to use uh, working in the clinic. We are nowhere near this by any means. And in fact, we don't even know how to create such a knowledge base to be able to create such a resource. So we've started a new program called uh, the Clinical Genome Resource. It is a research program to build sort of the engine for how to go from the massive primary literature about genomic variants and their disease relevance to actually a resource that can be used clinically. And talk about another bridge building activity, that absolutely is. We make no pretense it's going to be simple, but we also know that if we didn't get smart people working on this with a research brain around, it would never happen. And so this is very hot because it's really important and it's far from being solved, uh, but we need to solve it. So. That's my 25 years of genomics in, what, about 45, 50 minutes. Let me now just spend the net last 15 minutes shifting gears. Um, and to set up that shift, let me just point out how much genomics has changed in, in my professional career. The, um, you know, when I got involved in genomics, literally when the word got invented and the Genome Project started, you know, this, it was all about researchers. It was just a bunch of geeks like me working at the bench, some people working at a computer. But it was just scientists working in genomics. When the Genome Project ended 13 years ago, you know, I think we did get healthcare professionals interested in genomics. They saw these clinical research opportunities, and all these are very exciting, such as the hot areas I just reviewed for you. What I think the big transition going on now, and will continue until, will now continue going forward, and intensify really, I think, over the next few years, is that patients are genomics is getting relevant for them. And if it's relevant for patients, it means it's relevant for friends and relatives of patients, which means all of us. I alluded to something like cancer. I, I believe that people increasingly, when they get a diagnosis of cancer, the word genomics is going to be spoken to them by their oncologist. And that may be their first time they bump into the word genomics. And all of us, all of us, know family members or friends who have cancer. And it means all of us have to get more and more knowledgeable and uh, literate in the words of genomics. And I think this is going to become sort of part of the fabric of society, certainly part of the fabric of healthcare delivery. And that's very exciting. It's also a little intimidating. It comes with it a lot of responsibilities, a lot of things we think about. Well, this is all um, sort of a, a, a setup for the last story I want to tell you, which I guess I'll bring in the guest speaker that you promised. And, it, it, and the guest speaker really is the president. Um, uh, if you think he's coming in person, you are so naive. Um, so it's not. Um, um, but but the president, actually, it turns out, oh, by the way, that's the president. If any of you didn't know who this guy was, I didn't label it, I, although I did at the top. He actually uh, loves genomics. Um, and you may think, oh, well, he loves everything, but he actually really does love genomics. What you may not realize is that when he was a senator in 2006, he actually introduced a bill in the U.S. Senate called the Genomics and Personalized Medicine Act of 2006. Um, it actually didn't go very far, uh, but, but, he got, but it signaled his interest not only in science, but in particular in genomics. And uh, you know, it maybe wasn't totally by accident that you know, he picked Francis Collins to be the NIH director. I think he was well aware of what was going on in genomics, and this was something he's, and also, by the way, it wasn't totally an accident that he picked Eric Lander, who's a very prominent genomic scientist, um, um, and major leader in the Human Genome Project, and major leader of one of the big centers that we fund. Uh, Eric Lander is co-chair of the President's Council of Advisors of Science and Technology. So, you know, the President did surround himself with some great genomic minds. Um, and he's always asked lots of questions about genomics as, he, as he's been, and he's gotten very, he loves science, and he's been very supportive of the NIH. Um, and so, uh, now I'll tell you a story, all true story. 
um, that you may be some you may have heard some of this. You may not have ever heard me tell this story, but um, everything I'm telling you is absolutely true. Um, in June of 2014, uh, the president um, convened a meeting in, his, in the Oval Office that included Francis Collins and it included Eric Lander, who I just mentioned. It included his science advisor, John Holdren, and some other key people, including some key um, uh, political and policy people immediately around him. And they went to the Oval Office to actually to talk about genomics and some of the hot stuff I was telling you about. And what the president basically said at that meeting was, uh, you know, I'm not going to be president that much longer. I'm looking for projects and programs that I could launch while I'm still president. Uh, hopefully things that'll be bipartisan because I got to get things through the Congress and I'd like it to be part of my legacy. And uh, when apparently when you use the L word, it gets a lot of attention when you're the president because legacy means he really was going to take this very seriously. And uh, at that first meeting of June of 2014, the president was convinced by the people there, including Francis and Eric Lander, that, that not to keep it just focused on genomics. This is going to lead to what Wynn started with is that president was knowledgeable about genomics and somewhat knowledgeable about personalized medicine and individualized medicine. It was actually interesting. At that meeting, they decided to reframe this. And it was uh, decided even then by the president, apparently, to actually broaden this to precision medicine. And precision medicine just sort of takes in all aspects of, of individualized knowledge and just be more precise in how you practice medicine. And as illustrated on this cartoon, it includes not only the G's, A's, T's, and C's of a patient's genome, but also other things that we are getting better and better at measuring that make each of us unique. Aspects about our lifestyle, how much we exercise, aspects about our physiology, aspects about what we're exposed to chemically, what you know, and, 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 and maybe our diet and so forth. And the idea is if you would take all these individual factors into account, including genomics, you could be more precise in the practice of medicine. So it really is just a broader context for individualizing medical care. And I think the other thing the president recognized is that genomics is sort of the front ebb of this because of the technical advances that we have for reading out DNA of people. But indeed, there are other technical advances that are happening that we will see over the next decade in our ability to measure things about our physiology, measure things about our diet, measure things about environmental exposures, and so forth. And so the idea, pretty simple, which I think at this point you all sort of can get, is that Today, most of what we do is based on the response of the average patient. We treat patients pretty generically, and by trial and error, we eventually figure out the best way to treat them, and oftentimes we don't figure that out precisely because we're treating them in an average mode. But boy, if tomorrow we could eventually have medical care where we take into individual aspects of people's genomics and their environmental and lifestyle differences, we could be more precise. And the president just said, you know, how do we get from today to tomorrow? And so that was June of 2014. He's Spoke to Francis, said, please go off and develop a plan, involve other government agencies, the FDA, some other parts of the government. But it was really the lead for NIH to come up with a plan. Um, and a number of us, including myself, sort of had our summers ruined uh, the summer of 2014 because we already had things to do. But all of a sudden, we had another thing that was, we came up with all sorts of ideas. We ripped them up, other ideas ripped them up, passed things around, eventually came up with a plan. Um, that sounded pretty good. That plan was brought back to the president in October of 2014. There's an actual photograph from that Oval Office meeting. There's Francis, there's Eric Lander. You know, this is John Podesta, who's now running Hillary Clinton's campaign. These, and the, Valerie Jarrett, I mean, these are, and this is Secretary Burwell. This, these are all big shots, right? Um, and so this was really important, and the plan was presented, and the president said, go for it. He was all in favor of it. And he said, we'll build this into the budget, which is now the, what was then the early days of formulating the fiscal 16 budget, which just got announced a few weeks ago, finally, after it got through Congress. Um, and he said, I'm going to make this a priority. I'm absolutely going to do this. And then as the fall went on and we got towards the end of fiscal, uh, the calendar year 2015, it became apparent that the president was going to have a big rollout and make a big deal about this. And indeed, he did. And uh, we were all delighted. And we sort of knew it was coming, but we didn't know exactly what he was going to say, that in not this, just this month, but a year ago at the State of the Union address, this is what the president had to say. 21st century businesses will rely on American science and technology, research and development. I want the country that eliminated polio and mapped the human genome to lead a new era of medicine, one that delivers the right treatment at the right time. In some patients with cystic fibrosis, this approach has reversed a disease once thought unstoppable. 
So tonight I'm launching a new precision medicine initiative to bring us closer to curing diseases like cancer and diabetes and to give all of us access to the personalized information we need to keep ourselves and our families healthier. We can do this. Okay, so three observations from that brief clip. If you have never seen it before, that's really relevant. First of all, uh, anytime the President of the United States, I don't care what party it's from, whenever, anytime the President of the United States talks about your science, it's way cool. And the fact that he talked about genomics and all this stuff was just a real salute to the NIH and the whole biomedical research enterprise. That's way cool. Second thing is, did you notice that, and it was, I watched the whole state of the it was the only time all night that Biden and Boehner both clapped at the same time. It didn't happen any other time that whole night. And more importantly, it was the only time all night that people on both sides of the aisle stood up at the same time, signaling bipartisan support, which carried through in, through the budgeting process. And indeed, a request was for um, money for this year to start the Precision Medicine Initiative. That money came through in full uh, from the US Congress. So this was all very good. So that was the first reference to the initiative um, and that was January 20th, uh, precisely 10 days later. Um, in the East Room of the White House came the formal announcement. Those are actually pictures I took, uh, sitting about the sixth row center, um, when the president announced um, uh, the initiative more formally and in greater detail in a very um, well-scripted and uh, well-covered news coverage um, event. Um, and that was all very exciting because it basically kicked off his commitment to making this a reality. Now, the very, very hour that uh, this was announced by the president. Uh, New England Journal put up on their website a paper that they had subsequently been put into print, uh, written by Francis uh, Collins and then NCI Director Harold Varmus, that described in greater detail for the scientific community uh, the Precision Medicine Initiative, what was being envisioned for it. Um, this is another paper that I submitted. If you put up on whatever website you can access, you can certainly readily find this. Um, the reason Harold was a co-author on this is that a major front project as part of this initiative is one uh, uh, very along the lines of what I talked about with cancer genomics. Um, and the Cancer Institute is running with that where they're going to more aggressively pursue the use of genomic information as part of, um, of cancer care. And so, and that's described in this paper. And another component of this deals with some policy issues and how the FDA does some things. I'm not going to talk about that. What I thought I would talk about is the, the, the major, the largest component of this initiative which calls for the creation of a US national research cohort. Um, and the idea here is to um, basically um, involve, engage, and consent, and enroll um, something like a million US citizens to be research volunteers uh, over many years um, as part of a major study to, to accelerate progress in uh, precision medicine research. Um, the idea is that these people will agree um, to, to share lots of stuff about themselves share genomic data, lifestyle information, biological samples, and have all this linked to their electronic medical records, and have all that data available for scientists um, in the US and even elsewhere to analyze, to try to tease out many aspects of genomics and, and other personal information as it relates to their health and well-being. There are a lot of new things going to be tried in this program um, and this project, uh, new models for doing science that's going to involve extensively engaging participants. I'll say more to say about that in a second. Sharing data along the lines of what was done in the Genome Project and Thousand Genomes and ENCODE and everything else I've told you about. Have very open, responsible data sharing, but at the same time making sure we have a lot of privacy protections because these are going to be individuals on a lot of information about them. Um, there are ways to do this, but we have to do this very carefully. Now, the notion of creating um, at least a million people in a big cohort, and by the way, many people believe this is going to be much bigger than a million uh, by the time it all is done, turned out was not a new idea. And despite the fact that we spent a good part of the summer coming up with this idea of what the major flagship aspect of the Precision Medicine Initiative might be, at the end of the day, what we described was just a more modern version of what none other than Francis Collins proposed uh, over a decade ago in 2004. 2004, he wrote this commentary in Nature, which called for basically a smaller version of this cohort idea. Uh, but the fact of the matter is when he proposed this 10 years ago, it didn't, didn't go very far, it didn't get much traction. Um, but there's a reason for that. And you may say, well, why did you bring back to the president an idea that sort of didn't go very far 10 years ago? It's because 10 years makes all the difference. And what do I mean by that? And it, it really illustrates sort of the surge of enthusiasm for this that has gained a lot of traction, including political traction. 
Um, you know, there really are f five major things that are different between now and 10 or 11 years ago. One is what I've just told you about, genomics. You know, what we knew about the human genome 10 or 11 years ago was, was just minuscule. What our, our, at that point, it was still cost millions of dollars to sequence a human genome. Now it's almost 1,000. And just the, we just hadn't really seen the fruits of our knowledge and actually find their way clinical, to clinical applications, but we're seeing it now. So that was the easy one. This is sort of a world of difference between now and 11 years ago or so. But the other thing that really held things back 11 years ago was this was only going to work if we had really good electronic health records. And it was all proposed, oh, we've got to have all these electronic health records, all the genomic data, all this other data. Problem was, um, back in uh, 2004, um, about 20% of healthcare delivery systems in America had electronic health records in 2004. Today, that figure is over 90%, actually getting very close to 95%. So that infrastructure is already paid for. And while there's lots to be done to make them better and interoperable and get all the data, and there's a lot of imperfections, the fundamental infrastructure is already paid for, making it a much more affordable project. The other thing that's changed substantially, and this has gotten a lot, the president really got excited about this. There's a lot of people in the private sector who have been talking to the president about this as well, is technological innovation beyond genomics. And uh, the whole mobile health technology craze is just taking off like a rocket. One of the articles I submitted, you may want to read, is a recent review, it just came out like last week, talking about all these, um, these um, wearable sensors and all the crazy important physiological things they can measure on us. And you know, we, many people now recreationally you know, carry Fitbits or Fitbit-like things. This is like just recreational fun stuff. The stuff that's being developed in the private sector is going to be much more effective at measuring blood pressure and blood chemistries and EKGs and da, 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 right on down. And the notion of harnessing people, and by the way, don't think today, think five years from now, think 10 years from now, what these devices are going to be. And the idea is, okay, so people are going to be, we're going to take these individuals and they'll be wearing these devices, but then they're going to also be carrying smartphones and the smartphones will transmit the data to the central databases. And that's become very practical. You know, 10 years ago, only about a million Americans or less than 2% of American adults carried smartphones. Today, there's over 160 million people that carry smartphones. It's about 60% of adults, and that number is likely going to go up. And so the idea really is harness these million or more individuals with these wearable devices and constantly measure their physiology, increasingly measure their environmental exposure, measure what they're eating, and feed all that data into these data resources and accumulate it along with their medical data, their genomic data, and then you got a lot of data. And that's going to require a lot of analyses, and uh, thank goodness in the past 11 years, compute power has gone up about 160-fold, and we're going to need it to continue to go up. But, you know, I, this is biomedical research as far as I'm concerned. This is all going to be about what many of us are going to be doing, you know, over the next 10, 20, 30 years. It's going to be intensive data analysis, and this just sets the table for having all this data there to analyze. So those are the scientific things that really made the difference why this was proposed. Uh, now, even though it was proposed 10, 11 years ago. There was one other development, though, and watch as this unfolds, because you're going to hear a lot about this in the Precision Medicine Initiative. And that's going to be the relationship that we as a scientific community have with people who are in this cohort. They're not going to be subjects. They're not going to be patients. They're going to be partners. And they're going to be partners with us as scientists, and we're going to engage them, have them be part of the planning process. We're going to take advantage of sort of the social media movement that recruits them and, and, and keeps them involved, sort of citizen science movements and, um, and crowdsourcing movements and the whole Facebook generation and all these other things that'll supplant, you know, there'll be new things that take advantage of this as an energy force to bring people to projects and, and recognize that they're your partner and have them be part of it. And, and there's been studies done even since, actually as part of the Precision Medicine, they did some studies. The great majority of Americans want to participate in biomedical research. They just want to participate as long as they're not sort of sampled and then never spoken to again. They want to know who has their data, who's analyzed their data, what's, being, what's coming to their data, and they want the ability to say no more, or I don't want my data used for that. But as long as they're part of the process, they're, all, they're, they're the majority, not everyone, the majority are very enthusiastic. We want to harness that energy as part of this. So this is all sort of very high level. It's a lot of detail. It's going to be really big and really complicated. Um, Francis had an external group uh, really dig deep into this after the president's announcement for about six months. 
And that work, external working group came up with this report. If you want to read details, hundreds of pages of reporting information, you could read the details. There's now um, calls for grants that are coming in in the coming months, and uh, it's happening this year. It will get launched this year, and there's many components I don't even have time to talk about. I welcome you to, if you want to learn more about it, there's a great landing page at the NIH. It's a really easy URL to remember, and lots and lots and lots and lots of information is up there about the whole planning process leading up to, to sort of all the funding opportunities that are now out there. And um, this will continually be a resource where all information about the initiative um, is, is put. So last slide, I can't help but get a little um, nostalgic here because there is a, a very heavy sense of deja vu for at least me at a personal level, and I think others who have been involved in genomics, going back to my very first slide, is that I vividly remember, again, 25 years in three months or something like that, we launched the Genome Project October 1 in 1990. And um, you know, it was the fall, winter of 1990, and I was there, and it, literally, if you would have asked me at that time, how exactly are you gonna map and then sequence the human genome, I would have honestly told you I have no idea. And I didn't, because I know we launched the project with an audacious goal, and there were just so many details to be worked out, and that's how we did it along the way. We just constantly adjusted it, and we adjusted the plan, and eventually figured out how to actually map and sequence the human genome. And there's a very good chance one or more of you during the question and answer period are going to ask me a question about the precision medicine, and it's going to be detailed, and I'm going to say, I have no idea. I don't know how we're going to do that. And the fact is, it's exactly the same circumstance as it was 20, almost to the day 25 years ago. In that an audacious project has been launched, probably with more fanfare actually than the Genome Project, um, and yet there's so many things to be worked out, but it just seems like the right thing to do at this time, and it just seems like it has great potential to, to teach us an awful lot and really change how we think about practicing medicine and then having a test bed to test those things out. And so I think there's a historic irony here exactly 25 years apart, and uh, I've seen them both, and so I find it to be uh, highly uh, deja vu-like. So that's what I wanted to tell you. I painted a big landscape in multiple ways, and I'm happy to take any questions you may have. Okay, how do I sign up? How do you sign up? Uh, stay tuned. There's, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of um, a lot of announcements of how people can sign up for this thing. Yeah. So uh, I Anyone? would request that you use the microphone because there are many people online who want to hear what you have to say. Eric, you give the most fantastic, exciting, wonderful lectures, and I love it. Thank you very much. But here's my question. Uh -oh, now, now I have a hard question. <laughs> there are some folks that think that some diseases are actually increasing with time, for example, autism or maybe some autoimmune things. Is there, is this, will this cohort help us figure out over time if there is more changes in DNA, or could you work backwards, actually, and look at DNA from previous generations? So I'd have to think about looking at it. it certainly, if you had the DNA of previous generations, increasingly that's hard. There's no question that, and, and, and there are people I know in this audience who are even more sophisticated about this than I am, but you know, there's just no question the notion of a longitudinal study is always a more powerful one where, and by the way, there will, the precision medicine will include children. And the idea, and this is not a, this is not, unlike the Genome Project, the difference is, you know, this is not a 15-year project. This is a multi-decade project. The potential is to follow people longitudinally and obviously sample them and keep samples and put away samples and say, and someday we'll have a technology that allow us to look at something that we don't even know how to look at today. Absolutely. You could, and again, that's very powerful to be able to do it in a longitudinal way. Do you have other... Sure. Okay, you get two. If you want to attract people to give their DNA, could you promise them something like Ancestry.com, where you're oh. saying, I could tell you a little bit about your background, you know, no, that they it's would actually, love great, to No, no, and that's actually, that's a great question, and in fact, that's, that's, these are all actively being discussed now in the plan, is, is that, um, you know, how to make this so that people, you know, what's the early stuff you should give them, and of course, Lots of concern about giving them too much diagnostic information where the evidence about whether you're going to be a 10% greater chance of being diabetic is pretty weak. But there are a lot of fun things you can give. And Ancestry, is, as you know, is a, is a huge industry now because the, the analyses are pretty straightforward and they're highly informative and people enjoy it. And so, yeah, that's amongst the things that are being discussed of exactly what to be able to provide. But, you know, and part of what's going on now 
is talking to people, not scientists, people who are like Laurel, and say, what would you want to know? You know, again, use these individuals as our partners to help guide what, what, what do they want to know and what do they not want to know and what might excite them to get others to enroll. Yeah. Hey, uh, thank you for your talk. Um, I know there's a there's a woman in our lab who we just found out is recently pregnant with twins and was able to determine from the genetic testing that there's at least one Y chromosome between them. So it's and did it through non invasive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, my question was, you were mentioning all the ethical. Um, yeah ethical dilemmas that come from testing at birth. Um, I believe that like the Finns have like a very robust system of clinical enrollment for collecting perinatal, prenatal data. Um, I know they don't do genetic testing necessarily, but they do collect essentially the material that would enable such a system. I was wondering, are there any international models that you look for and look to in terms of determining how to handle those? Well, you raise a great point. There's no run model I can think of, but you're absolutely right. The, the different societies mm -hmm. absolutely handle this very, very differently. A lot of that is cultural. Mm -hmm. By the way, I, I, I should really stress, because I forgot to mention it, it's not that in the United States we don't do any um, newborn screening for genetic disorders. In fact, in, in all developing countries of the world screen all newborns for a battery of, of genetic diseases. In the United States, it depends what state you're born in. It depends it determines whether you get two or three or four dozen different diseases. Um, and so the uh, you know the, the the simple logic as well. If we're going to look at you know four dozen, three dozen genetic diseases, but we have the ability to look for 3,500. Let's look for 3,500. That's the logic. Now there are and, and some countries are embracing that uh, more aggressively than others. By the way, I I was um, I was just in China a couple months ago, and I don't know the details, but. There is there is significant discussion. I heard from multiple places that you know China might take a much more um, aggressive approach to newborn sequencing, as one as one country as an example. And other countries I have heard uh, getting much more engaged in this. And you know a lot of it has to do with some cultural aspects of of, of medical information and medical systems and how all those get integrated. I think there's another question. Sure. So a, a big part of like modern healthcare is based on uh, blockbuster pharmaceuticals, which is sort of seems like the opposite of precision medicine. You had that figure up there before with yep. all those blockbuster drugs. So how do you see the precision uh, medicine initiative? Um, like what will, the, what will be the relationship between that and the pharmaceutical industry in like the coming decade or as this progresses? So it's a great question. It's one that gets, is, is being thought about and looked at a lot. And I mean, I think there's a lot of interest. I mean, I can give you two examples that are typically, number one, uh, the. Pre the Precision Medicine co Initiative cohort probably will give us one of the best um, experimental systems for testing pharmacogenomics. So, you know, in my two-minute description of pharmacogenomics, I probably oversimplified it into thinking that it's going to just work for every drug. It's actually far more complicated than that, as many things are. And one of the things that's needed are, 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 far, are far larger studies for larger sets of medications. And you'll just get it you'll get it for free when you think about it, because if, you if you're already, if you having a million people follow it and all their medical information is there, you get their genomic information, now it's just a data analysis issue. And so one thing is improved pharmacogenomic knowledge. The second thing is the more we learn about the genomic risks associated with common diseases, it gives us knowledge about what biological pathways are affected leading to hypertension, diabetes, and so forth. And there's no question we will learn some of, we will advance our knowledge of common disease genomics through current efforts and precision medicine will help a lot of this. And that gives pharmaceutical companies pathways to sort of target pharmaceutical development. So, you know, those are two sort of very general areas that would, would, would be very, great relevant. Yeah. Hi. Uh, I hope I have the ability here to even ask an intelligent question. I'm actually uh, here as the, uh, I'm actually here as the uh, father of a, a patient um, across the street in Building uh -huh. 10, my daughter. Received a bone marrow transplant a couple of years ago, or a couple of months ago. A few years ago, she was diagnosed here with um, with the rare disease, and my family is very grateful for the the rare disease research that was alluded to here. Um, my my question is is this, and, and maybe I just didn't pick up on it, but everything that you uh, that that was discussed in the hour that I was here seemed to talk about how the uh, information could be harnessed to start making different decisions, treating things differently, but I didn't. I didn't hear, and maybe this is still science fiction, about actually altering uh, the genome. And in, sure. in the case of my daughter's diagnosis, this DOC8 mutation, as it's called, um, you know, can, 
can something like that be done or at, at birth is it just too late when you've got something uh, that's in every cell of your body? Yeah, so it's, so again, I, I always get, and I look out in the audience, I know there's people that know more about this than I do. I'll try to give a, but people can feel free to, if you know science, help me here. But so the, the notion of, of, of gene therapy or manipulated genome is, is not a new concept. In fact, the, the first successful gene therapy study was done right here in the clinical center, but it was done for a disease that affected white blood cells, which are easily accessible, can be removed, you can engineer things and, and then put back. Um, and so for a disease like that, we have a task for that. Um, the problem is, if my mic is still up, I'm gonna defend, maybe the battery died. Time's yep, time's up. That's right, too long to answer. Um, uh, but for a lot of other diseases, access to the relevant cells and tissues and changing that is not as simple. Um, cystic fibrosis is a great example of that, where there is a lot of effort to think about for cystic fibrosis, could we just change the cells that are affected, but getting access of, to the lung cells and then changing the day. And, and, and in fact, the fact of the matter, and you'll, you probably are hearing, and there's a lot of discussion now about really fancy new methods for very precisely cutting out and replacing DNA using CRISPR-Cas9. I know it's a geeky phrase, but it's even in the news. So it's the, the capability is there. The problem is, is a lot of the mechanics of getting the right changes in the right cells, putting it back, and then there's a whole lot of concerns about when you go to do these things, do you inadvertently screw up some other part of the genome? But this is all, this is all in the toolbox of possibilities. Um, but it's, 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 it's hard. For a, for a lot of disorders, it's, it's very, very hard. And so I think m many people believe that knowledge about the biological pathways that are disruptive and coming up with drugs that tweak and twist, you know, do things to influence it is, is maybe the more uh, surefire way, although even that's hard too. Sure. Okay. Thanks. Uh, yeah. Thanks very much for your uh, remarks, Eric. I just wanted to ask you, as this large database is being built, yeah. um, how will it be assured that a uh, whole variety of different uh, ethnic and racial groups are included in this for obvious reasons? Um, uh, uh, yeah, so a, a big part of what the working group looked at and what the current set of advisors and anybody, uh, institute director, I mean, all of us are fully cognizant of how important this is and how to do this right. And it, there's so many different levels of diversity, ethnic, uh, geographic origin, but also socioeconomic, um, one could imagine. And so all these things and, you know, and thinking about we want to make sure we do this in a way that doesn't exacerbate health, health disparities, and you got to be really careful. So all you know, all these things are being thought about, and it's one of the reasons why we can imagine having it be much bigger than a million is probably the way to go. I think sensitivity and awareness from the inception will go will be a good first step, but a constant sort of analysis that would who, you know constant study of what you have coming in in terms of individuals there. Their, and their various demographics is going to be a very important part of this. So, Eric, let me uh, ask a question about education. Yeah. So you, you were addressing the public in terms of becoming volunteers in this. Yeah. But that's probably that, and well, these folks are all graduate students, postdocs, and so yep. forth. So you know, they're they're well into the environment. <clears throat> so how does this become linked to elementary school education? to teaching genomics uh, in a full sense of meaning to young, very young people. Uh, uh, my grandchildren who are 9, 10, 11, uh, they ask questions. Sure. You know, they're much brighter than, than we are. So how do we incorporate the younger generation in the educational process. Yeah, so it's something, and I'm just taking genomics as a subset of the universe of precision medicine, but even genomics, that's something we think a lot about at the end. I have a whole branch, an education branch, you know, but if, and we think about what we can do to catalytically advance this, both at the level of the general public, you know, uh, primary education, but also professional education. We think a lot about, you know, I think about my medical school class, you know, they're, you know, mid-50s, they're going to practice, and yet, you know, genomics was never spoken to them once in medical school, and yet they're going to, they're, they're dealing with genomics now, and they're going to do it for the next two or three decades of their career. How do we get practicing healthcare pharmacists, uh, I mean, everybody, the neuro so we think about all these things, and, and um, it, these are great challenges. That all is taking place 
in a conversation about scientific literacy in America, which is even bigger than all of us. Um, but we do what we can. I mean, and there's a lot of things we've done, and we, I constantly stress, as a research organization, we can only do so much, but we can try to be catalytic. And we, there's a number of things we, we continue to do to try to improve genomic literacy. Did you want to ask a question? Yeah, yeah j just a quick question regarding um, like what the privacy implications would be of, of genetic information being stored. So if you're sampling a million people's genetic information, maybe someday everybody's genetic information, uh, if that's linked to uh, their electronic health records, or, and, yeah, right. Well, uh, biosecurity and other things are starting to use this kind of information as identification. Um, how would we ensure, first of all, that's a lot of data, and how would you ensure it's uh, security? And, and, and as the, all things uh, that are being carefully thought about, looked at, and of course, it's, as, it's, it's not even, some of this is not even scientific per se. It's, you know, think about the greater interest just about health privacy information even before we impose the Precision Medicine Initiative. So I think these are important, hard problems that go well beyond the NIH. It's, and I think if anything else, the Precision Medicine Initiative is capturing the attention of people on Capitol Hill about how important this is. Even even before the initiative starts, and that we need to be addressing this in a, on a larger scale, uh, because you know there's a, you know all of us are also you know a lot, maybe people are carrying Fitbits, and people can be getting those information, and people are getting electronic medical records, accumulating lots of private information and pharmacy information, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, there's there there as you know, there's a diversity of views out there. Some that believe that nothing's private anymore, and that Lots of people are scaling, lot, and that we're just going to have to figure out how to deal with the world. And then other people believe there's many, many better tools we could use for improving security. Okay. Well, listen. Okay. Thank you very, very much, Eric. That was a tour de force.